Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes Chapter 5 When they got to the motel, Jessica was already there. And so was John. He stood up when Charlie walked in. I was worried about you. I thought maybe I could sleep on the floor. He waited nervously for her reaction, as though he had realized, only upon seeing her, that he might have overstepped her boundaries. On another day, in another place, Charlie might have been annoyed by his excessive concern. But here, in Hurricane, she was glad to have it. We should all be together, she thought. It's safer. She wasn't really afraid. But unease still clung to her like cobwebs, and John's presence had been a calming one ever since they arrived. He was still looking at her, waiting for a response, and she smiled at him. As long as you don't mind sharing the floor with Jason, she said. He grinned. Just let me have a pillow and I'll be fine. Marla tossed him one, and he stretched elaborately, set it on the ground, and lay down. They all went to bed almost immediately. Charlie was exhausted. Now that her injury had been cleaned and bound, the adrenaline of the night left her body all at once, leaving her drained and a little shaky. She didn't even bother changing to pajamas. She just collapsed on the bed next to Jessica and was asleep in seconds. Charlie woke just after dawn when the sky was still pale and a little pink. She looked around the room. The others wouldn't be up for hours, she suspected, but she was too alert to try to fade back into sleep. She grabbed her shoes and, stepping over Jason's and John's sleeping bodies, went outside. The motel was set a little way back off the road. Trees spread thickly around and behind it. Charlie sat down on the curb to put her shoes on, wondering if she could go for a walk in the woods without getting lost. The air was crisp, and she felt renewed and energized by the brief night's sleep. Her arm hurt, a dull and pulsing pain that kept drawing her attention, but it had not bled through the bandages. Charlie usually found it easy to ignore pain when she knew she was not in danger from it. The woods were inviting, and she decided to risk getting lost. As she was about to stand, John sat down beside her. Morning, he said. His clothes were rumpled from his night on the motel floor, and his hair was a mess. Charlie held back a laugh. What? What? He said. She shook her head. You look a little like your old self today, she said. He looked down at himself and shrugged. Clothes don't make the man. What are you doing up so early? I don't know. Couldn't sleep. What about you? Somebody stepped on me. Charlie winced. Sorry, she said, and he laughed. I'm just kidding. I was awake. I was going to go for a walk, she said, pointing at the tree line. Out there, somewhere. Do you want to come? Yeah, definitely. They headed into the woods. And John hung back for a moment, and surreptitiously retucked his shirt, trying to smooth out the wrinkles. Charlie pretended not to notice. There was no path, and so they made their way through the trees at random, glancing back now and then to be sure they could still make out the motel parking lot. John stumbled over a fallen branch, and Charlie reached out with her good arm to catch him before he fell. Thanks, he said. Strong arm, too. Well, you caught me yesterday, so it's only fair that I catch you back. Now we're even, she said. She looked around. The motel was scarcely in sight, and she felt concealed, made safe by the woods. She could see anything here, and it would be all right. She leaned back against the tree, picking idly at the bark behind her. You know, Freddy's was in the first restaurant. She said it abruptly, surprising herself, and John looked at her quizzically, like he had not quite heard her. She didn't want to say it again, but she forced herself. Freddy's. It wasn't my dad's first restaurant. There was a diner, a little one. It was before my mom left. 
I had no idea. John said slowly, Where was it? I don't know. It's one of those memories from when you're a little kid, you know? You only remember the things that are right around you. I remember the linoleum on the kitchen floor. It was this black and white diamond pattern. But I don't remember where the restaurant was, or what it was called. Yeah, John said. We took a vacation to a theme park when I was, like, three. And all I remember is the back seat of the car. So were they there? His voice dropped a little quieter when he said it, almost reflexively. Charlie nodded. Yeah, there was a bear and a rabbit, I think. Sometimes the details get mixed up in my head. They're not like normal memories, she said, needing him to understand the story's defects before she told him the rest. It's like when you have a realistic dream, and in the morning, you're not sure if it really happened or not. It's just impressions, little snatches of time. It's... She trailed off. She wasn't explaining it right. She was choosing all the wrong words. She was reaching back too far in her memory, to a time when she did not yet speak. It was a time when she did not have the words to name the things she saw. And so now, when she tried to recall them, the words could never be right. She looked at John. He was watching her patiently, waiting for her to go on. She wanted to tell him this story from her life that she had never told. It was not even a story, not really, just something that nagged at the edge of her mind, something flashing by randomly in the corner of her eye. She was not entirely certain it was real, and so she told no one. She wanted to tell John, because she wanted to speak it to another person, because he looked at her with trusting eyes, and she knew he would listen to and believe her. Because he had cared for her a long time ago, because he had caught her when she fell, and he had come here to sleep and keep watch all night, and thought a pragmatic, slightly cruel part of her, because he was not part of her real life. She could tell him this, tell him anything, and when she returned home, it would be as though it had never happened. She wanted, suddenly, to touch him, have confirmation that he was really there, that this was not another dream. She reached out her hand to him, and, surprised but glad, he took it. He stayed where he was, as if afraid that moving in closer would scare her. They stayed that way for a moment, and then she let go, and she told him the story the way she spoke it in her head. The memories of a small child mixing with the things she had come to understand as she grew older. There was another restaurant, rustic and small, with red checkered cloths on the tables, and a kitchen you could see into from the dining area. And they all were there together, her father and her mother and us. When Charlie was very, very young, she was never alone. There was Charlie and there was a little boy. A little boy, so close to Charlie, that remembering him was like remembering a part of herself. They were always together. She learned to say we before she learned to say I. They played together on the floor of the kitchen, sometimes drawing pictures while hiding under a hardwood table. She remembered the shuffling of feet and the shadows of customers walking by. Light was broken by a slowly turning fan and thrown across the floor in ribbons. She remembered the smell of an ashtray and the hearty laughter of adults lost in a good story while their children played. Very often, she would hear her father's laugh echoing from a distant corner as he talked with customers. When Charlie pictured him laughing like that now, it was with a little ache, a sucking feeling in the center of her chest because his eyes were bright and his smile was easy, and because he wanted them all to be a part of the restaurant, to share his work freely, because he was not afraid to let his children roam and explore. He was yet untouched by grief, and so, while he looked a little like the father she truly remembered, he was not the same man at all. Charlie was looking down at the ground as she talked, 
at the dirt and stones and cracked remains of leaves, and her hand was at her back, stripping bark from the tree. Does that hurt the tree? she thought, and forced her hands away, knotting them in front of her. The restaurant was open until late at night, and so when they began to falter, Charlie and the little boy would crawl into the pantry with blankets and soft toys to sleep until it was time to close. She remembered using sacks of flour as pillows, big bags almost as long as they were tall. They would snuggle down together and whisper words of nonsense that meant deep things only to the two of them, and Charlie would drift into sleep, half listening to the warm sounds of the restaurant, the clank of dishes, and the murmur of grown-ups' talk, and the sound of the bear and the rabbit as they danced to their chiming tunes. They loved the animals, the yellowish-brown bear, and the matching rabbit, who wandered the restaurant dancing and singing for the customers, and sometimes just for Charlie and the little boy. They sometimes moved stiffly and mechanically, and sometimes with fluid human movements, and while the boy liked the animals best when they acted like people, Charlie liked them the other way. Their stilted movements, their lifeless eyes, and their occasional glitches fascinated her. They acted alive, but were not. The narrow, yet bottomless chasm between those things, alive and not alive, enthralled her, though she would never have been able to explain why. I think they were costumes, Charlie said now, still looking down at the ground. The animals weren't always robots. The bear and the bunny were costumes. And sometimes people wore them. And sometimes my father put it onto one of his robots, and you could always tell which it was by the way they danced. Charlie stopped. There was more, but she could not bring herself to speak. There was something else that made her lock down her mind and force the memory away, the part that made her unwilling to ask Aunt Jen for answers, because she was afraid of what those answers might be. Charlie had not dared to look at John the whole time she was talking, staring only at the ground, at her hands, at her sneakers. Now she did look at him, and he was wrapped, seeming almost to be holding his breath. He waited, not wanting to speak, until he was sure she was finished. That's all I remember, she said at last, even though it was a lie. Wait, who was the little boy? John said. Charlie shook her head, frustrated that he had not understood. He was mine, she said. I mean, he was my brother. We were the same. She was speaking, childishly, as if the memory had taken hold of her, forcing her to regress. She cleared her throat. Sorry, she said, speaking more slowly, trying to choose her words with care. I think he was my twin brother. She saw John open his mouth, about to ask the question, what happened to him? But there must have been something in her face, something warning, because he held it back and said instead, do you think that place was around here? I mean, I guess it could have been anywhere, another state even. I don't know, Charlie said slowly, looking over her shoulders, then up at the trees. This all feels the same. It feels like I could walk around my corner, and it could be there. Her voice began to break. I want to find it, she added suddenly. And as soon as she said it, it was what she wanted to do. Well, what do you remember about it? John said enthusiastically, almost lunging forward like an eager dog on a lead. He must have been dying to go looking from the moment she mentioned the place. Charlie smiled, but shook her head. I really don't remember much. She said, I don't know how much help I can actually be. Like I said, the things I remember are just little scraps. They're not information. It's like a picture book. She closed her eyes, trying to see the place in her mind's eye. The floor would shake. She lifted her head as the thought became clear. A train? She asked, as though John would know. I remember this thunderous sound 
every day. It was the biggest sound I've ever heard. I don't mean loud. I mean, you could feel it in your whole body, like it was rumbling right through your chest. It must have been close to some tracks then, right? John said. Yeah, Charlie said with a spark of hope. There was a tree out in front, she went on. It looked like an old angry monster, hunched forward and wizened, with two giant gnarled branches reaching out like arms. Whenever we left for the night, I hid my face in my father's shirt so I wouldn't have to see it as we walked by. What else? John said. Were there stores or other restaurants? No. I mean, I don't think so. I'm sorry. She scratched her head. It's gone. It's not enough, John said a little frustrated. It could be anywhere. A train and a tree. There must be something else you can remember. Anything? No, Charlie said. The more she pushed herself to remember, the harder it got. She was grasping blindly, and it was like trying to get a hold of living creatures, as if the memories saw her coming and slipped away. She tossed out fragments as she managed to catch them. The tablecloths, red and white checked, and made of real cloth, not plastic. She remembered grabbing at one, unsteady on her feet, and the whole table setting falling down on top of her, plates and glasses shattering around her as she covered her head. Charlotte, are you okay? Her father's voice seemed clearer than ever. There was a squeaky floorboard in the corner of the diner that Charlie liked to push on, making it sing as if it made music. There was a picnic table out back where they used to sit in the sun, one leg of it sinking in the soft ground. There was the song her parents used to sing in the car whenever they came home from a trip. They would burst into it when they were a little way from home, and then they'd start laughing, as if they had done something clever. It's nothing helpful, Charlie said. Just kid stuff. She felt a little lightheaded. She had spent so many years avoiding these memories. Her mind shied away, as if from snakes. Having done it, she felt strange and a little guilty, like she had done something wrong. But she also felt something that might have been joy in the things she never allowed herself to think of. The memories of that time were unsafe. There were traps and snares wrought into their very substance, but there were precious things among them. Sorry, she said. I can't remember more. No, that's really impressive. I can't believe you remember that far back at all, he said. I didn't mean to push you, he added, a little sheepishly. Ben looked thoughtful. What was the song? I think it was the same one they danced to at Freddy's, Charlie said. No, the one your parents sang in the car. Oh, she said. I don't know if I remember it. It wasn't really a song, you know. It was just a little line. She closed her eyes, picturing the car trying to envision the backs of her parents' heads, as though she were still in the back seat. She waited, trusting her mind to give it up, and after a moment, it did. She hummed, just six notes. We're back in harmony, she sang. And they'd, you know, harmonize, she added, embarrassed by her parents even now. John's expression was blank for a moment, as the words at first seemed meaningless. But then, his eyes lit with promise. Charlie, there's a town north of here called New Harmony. Huh, was all she said for a moment. She listened to the words in her head, wanting them to set off an inspiration, trip a memory. But they did not. I feel like that should ring a bell. But it doesn't, she said. Sorry. I mean, it doesn't sound wrong, but it doesn't sound right either. She was disappointed, but John still had that thoughtful look on his face. Come on, he said, extending his hand. Charlie wiped her cheek and took a shaky breath, then looked to him. She nodded with an exhausted smile and got to her feet. Should we wait for everyone to wake up? John said, as they emerged into the parking lot after a brisk walk back. No, Charlie said with unexpected vehemence. I don't want everyone there for this, she added 
in softer tones. Just the thought of the whole group going along made her anxious. It was too risky, too private. She had no idea what they might find or what it might do to her. And she couldn't abide the thought of making those discoveries with an audience. Okay, John said. Just us, then. Just us. Charlie went inside and grabbed her car keys, moving slowly so as not to disturb the others. As she was heading back to the door, Jason stirred and opened his eyes, looking up at her like he wasn't quite sure who she was. She put a finger to his lips. He nodded sleepily and closed his eyes again, and she hurried out the door. She tossed the keys to John and got in on the passenger side. There's a map in here, she said, jostling open the glove box door. The map fell out amid a pile of hand warmers and emergency food rations. Your aunt strikes again, John smiled. Charlie held the map just a few inches from her face. New Harmony was close, only about half an hour away. Think you can navigate? He asked. Aye, Cap'n, Charlie said. Turn left out of the lot. Thanks, he said wryly. They drove back through the town and out the other side, the houses farther and farther between as they went. Each one stood solitary, connected only by sagging power lines. Charlie watched the telephone poles and the dipping wires, repeating hypnotically as if they would go on forever, then blinked, breaking the spell. Ahead of them, the mountains rose up ancient and dark against the clear blue sky. They looked more solid than anything else around them, more real, and maybe they were. They had been here, watching, long before the houses, long before the roads, and they would be here long after they were all gone. Nice day, John said, and she looked at him, tearing her gaze from the view. Yeah, Charlie said, I kind of forgot how beautiful it is out here. Yeah, he said. He was quiet for a moment. Ben looked at her sideways, and Charlie couldn't tell if he was being shy or just keeping his eyes on the road. It's weird, he said at last. When I was a kid, the mountains kind of scared me, especially when we were driving in the dark. They were like some monstrous beasts looming over us. He laughed a little, but Charlie did not. I know what you mean, she said, then grinned at him. I think they're pretty much just mountains, though. Hey, she said suddenly, you never told me what your story was about. My story? He flicked his eyes at her, a little nervous. Yeah, you said you got a story published. What was it about? I mean, it was just a little magazine, just local, he said, still reluctant. Charlie waited, and finally he continued. It's called The Little Yellow House. It's about a boy, he said. He's ten years old, his parents are fighting all the time, and he's afraid they're going to get divorced. They fight, and he overhears them saying awful things to each other, and he hides in his room with the door shut. But he can still hear them. So when he starts looking out the window, at the house across the street, they sort of keep their curtains open, just enough that he can glimpse inside. He watches them go in and out of the house, this family, and he starts making up stories about them, imagining who they are and what they do. And after a while, they start feeling more real to him than his own family. He glanced at Charlie again, as if trying to gauge her reaction, and Charlie smiled. He went on, so summer comes and his family goes away for a week, and it's miserable, and when they get back, the family in the house across the street has moved away. There's nothing left, just a for sale sign hanging in front. Charlie nodded, waiting for him to continue, but he looked at her a little sheepishly. That's the end, he said. Oh, she said. That's really sad. He shrugged. I guess. I'm working on something happy now, though. What's that? He grinned at her. It's a secret. Charlie smiled back. It felt good to be out here. Good to just be diving out into the horizon. She cranked the window down and put her arm out into the air. 
enjoying the feel of the rushing wind. It's not wind rushing, it's us, she thought. What about you? John said. What about me? Charlie said, still happily playing against the wind. Come on, what's the life of Charlie like these days? Charlie smiled at him and pulled her arm back into the car. I don't know, she said. There was a part of her that did not want to tell him for the same reason she wanted him with her now. She did not want her new life to mix with the old. But John had told her something real, something personal, and she felt like she owed him the same in return. It's all right, she said at last. My aunt is cool, even if she does sometimes look at me like she's not quite sure where I came from. School's fine. I have friends and all that, but it feels so temporary. I have another year, but I feel like I'm already gone. Gone where? John asked, and Charlie shrugged. I wish I knew. College, I guess. I'm not sure what comes next. Nobody ever knows what comes next, I guess, he said. Do you? He stopped himself, but she prodded him. Do I what? She said teasingly. Do I ever think of you? He flushed, and she instantly regretted the words. I was going to say, do you ever see your mom? He said quietly. Oh, she said. No, I don't. It exhausted Charlie to think of her mother, and she thought her mother felt the same. Too much hung between them, not quite blame, because neither of them were to blame for what had happened, but something close to it. Their pain, individual, radiated off them both like auras, pushing at each other like magnets with the poles reversed, forcing them apart. Charlie? John was saying her name, and she looked over at him. Sorry, she said. I drifted for a second. You got any music in this car? He asked. And she nodded, eagerly, seizing on the diversion. She bent over, picked up cassettes scattered on the floor, and started reading labels. He made fun of her tapes, she argued back, and after some playful bickering, she shoved a tape into the player and settled back again to stare out the window. I think this is where the map's usefulness ends. John gestured to the road ahead. The whole area is pretty much blank. I think what we're looking for isn't going to be on this map. He folded the map and tucked it neatly to the side of the seat, craning his neck out the window to see what they were passing. Yeah, she said. It looked like they had returned to civilization. Single houses littered the fields, and dirt roads branched off in all directions. The landscape was mostly bushes and short trees, the whole area nestled between rows of low-lying mountains. John looked at Charlie, hoping she would notice something that would point them in the right direction. Nothing? He said though her blank stare had already given him the answer. No, she said plainly. She didn't want to elaborate. The houses became fewer and more scattered, and the fields of dry brush seemed to stretch wider, giving the whole area a feeling of desertion. John found himself glancing over at Charlie at short intervals, waiting for a signal, half expecting her to tell him to stop and turn around. But Charlie just stared into the distance, her eyes fixing on nothing, resting her cheek in her hand. Let's go back, she said finally, sounding resigned. We could have missed something, John said. He slowed the car, looking for a spot to make a U-turn. We missed a lot back there. Maybe it's down one of those dirt roads. Charlie laughed. Really? You think we missed a lot? She grew thoughtful. No, none of this feels right. Nothing rings a bell. She felt a tear spill onto her cheek, and she swiped it away before John could notice. Okay, no worries, Charlie said abruptly, pulling herself back from reverie. Let's grab a bite, just you and me, John smiled, still checking his mirrors for a place to turn. Charlie shivered. Then something caught her eye. She almost jumped in her seat, sitting straight up. Stop! She shouted. John slammed on the brakes, and the car skidded, dust billowing up all around the car. When they stopped, 
Charlie sat silently as John checked the rearview mirror again, his heart racing. Are you okay? He said. But Charlie was already out of the car. Hey! He called after her, scrambling out of his seatbelt and rushing to lock the car behind him. Charlie was running back toward the town, but her eyes were on the field beside the road. He caught up quickly, trotting along beside her without asking questions. After a few minutes, Charlie slowed and began shuffling her feet on the ground, peering down as though she had lost something small and valuable in the dirt. Charlie? John said. Until this moment, he had not thought about what it was they were doing. It was an adventure, a chance to be alone with Charlie, to run off after a clue. But now, she was starting to worry him. He brushed his hair back from his face. Charlie! He said again, his voice touched with concern. But Charlie did not look at him. She was intent on whatever she had found. Right here, she said. She made a sharp turn toward the edge of the road, where something protruded and snaked across the ground. John knelt carefully, brushing some of the loose dirt with his hand and exposing a flat metal beam. He kept going, uncovering a track that stretched across the road and went off into the field in both directions. It took him a moment to speak. It was as though the earth itself had tried to conceal it from them. Be careful, he thought with a minor pang of alarm. But he brushed aside the feeling. I think we found your tracks, he said, looking up at Charlie. But she was nowhere in sight. Charlie? He took a quick look up and down the road. But there were no cars. Charlie! He called again waving the dust away from his face and racing to catch up. When he reached her, he hung back a little, afraid to disturb her intense focus. There was a cluster of trees up ahead, gathered together as though around a campfire, tall and short or thick and scraggly. Charlie dragged her foot along the track as she walked, as if it might vanish if she ceased to touch it. What is that, an old station? John asked, squinting and blocking the sun with his hand. There was a long building nestled in the trees, its color blending in with the small grove, making it difficult to spot. The tracks veered away, heading off toward the mountains, and Charlie stopped dragging her foot along them, letting them go. John finally caught up, and they walked through the dry grass together toward the grove of trees, not far away now. There has to be a road. Charlie strayed almost randomly, heading away from the building. John hesitated. He gestured toward the building, then followed her, looking back to make sure he knew the way back to the car. Before long, the ground leveled out beneath their feet. Old pavement, broken with weeds and mounds of crumbling rock, stretched across the field in a narrow, almost hidden path, leading once again toward the small building. This is it. Charlie said softly. John approached her carefully, then stood at her side. They walked the road together, dodging around the pillars of grass that shot up from the brakes and holes. The tree was there, the one with reaching arms and ghastly face, but it was no longer frightening, no longer, as Charlie remembered. It must have already been dead when she was a child, she realized. Its limbs had fallen off, leaving jagged holes where they had been, and they lay where they fell, rotting into the ground. The tree seemed a frail and weak shade of its former self, only recognizable by the stumps and bulges on its side that had made its face. Now even the face looked tired. The building itself was long and dilapidated. It was a single story, with a dark roof and weather-beaten walls. The place had once been painted red, but time and sun and rain had won out over the paint. It was peeled and curling, whole long strips of it gone, and the wood beneath showing, dark, with what might be rot. Its foundation was overgrown with tall grass, and Charlie thought it looked as if it were sinking, as though the whole structure was slowly being swallowed by the earth. Charlie grabbed John's arm as they neared it, then let it go 
and straightened her back. She felt as though she were preparing for a fight, as if the building itself might attack if it sensed weakness. Charlie went warily up the few steps to the door, sticking to the edges and testing the wood before she let down her full weight. The stairs held, but there were soft, splintered patches in the middle she didn't want to try. John didn't follow her right away, sidetracked by something nearly hidden in the grass. Charlie, he held it up, a battered metal sign with the painted words, Fred Bear's Family Diner, in red script. Charlie gave a gentle smile. Of course this is it. I'm home. John came up the stairs behind her and set the sign down carefully by the door, and they went inside. The door swung open easily. Light streamed in through the windows on all sides, revealing emptiness and decay. Unlike Freddy's, this place had been cleaned out. The wooden floors seemed intact, but they were warped from weather. Sunlight was streaming in, unobstructed, and went where it wanted without furniture or people to block its path. Charlie looked up at the ceiling fan. It was still there, but one of its blades was missing. There were double doors to the right with circular windows. Unlike the dining area, which was breached with sunlight and the sounds of the outside, the room behind the double doors was still pitch black. John was more interested in this than Charlie, and he carefully peered into one of the windows, obviously tempted to nudge it open and see what was inside. Charlie left him to his curiosity and walked farther into the dining room, which she only knew as the dining room through memory. Now, it was a vacant and lonely room, stretching long and narrow, at least 50 feet, growing darker as it went. There was a slightly elevated stage at the end of the room, and Charlie realized as she looked around that the place had probably once been a dance hall, and a long desk by the entrance that her parents had used for a cash register had probably been a bar. She went over to it and saw that she was right. There were even grooves and scratches in the wood floor where bar stools had once dug their feet. She tried to picture it, a dark bar with a country western band playing on the stage, but she could not. When Charlie looked at the stage, she could still see two animatronic animals in shadow, moving in unnatural twists and turns. She could hear echoes of carnival music and distant laughter. She could smell the cigarette smoke in the air. She hesitated before going farther, as though the ghosts she remembered might linger on the stage. She tried to catch a glimpse of where John was. He finally had the door to the kitchen half open and was sticking his head inside. Charlie turned her attention back to the stage and walked toward it across the creaking floor. Even the smallest sound was deafening, accompanied by faint whistles as the wind slipped through cracks in the windows and walls. Strips of wallpaper had peeled down and hung flat against the wall, inert until a breeze lifted them up and they wagged like thin fingers pointing at Charlie as she walked. Charlie stood at the base of the stage, studying the floor carefully for traces of what might have stood there before. All that remained were holes where bolts had once been. The corners looked blackened, with the shapes of coils and wires etched into dirt and wood. Everything is gone. Her head jerked toward the corner to her right. There was another door. Of course there is another door. This is why you are here. She stood still, looking at the door, but not ready to touch it. She was grasped with a strange and illogical fear, as though spiders and boogeymen might come rushing out. The door was ajar. Charlie looked back toward John again, hesitant to go on without him. As though he heard her calling to him, he leaned out of the kitchen door with a wide-eyed expression. This is really creepy. 
He was obviously enjoying himself, like a kid in a haunted house. Can you come with me? Charlie's plea came as a surprise to John, who seemed pleased, but irritated at the same time, having been enjoying his own adventure on the other side of the building. Two seconds, he promised, then disappeared again. She rolled her eyes, disappointed, but not surprised, that his childish curiosity would take priority. She rested the back of her hand against the aged wooden door and gently guided it open, bracing herself against whatever might be inside. Whatever she had been expecting, this wasn't it. It was a closet, the inside extending off to her left about eight or nine feet into darkness. There were horizontal poles mounted along the walls where hangers had once been. Square shapes imprinted in the dust filled her mind with images of boxes, maybe speakers. As she stepped inside, she pushed the door open all the way, trying to let in as much light as possible. As she walked farther in, she let her hand drag along the wall. Although nothing was there now, she could feel heavy cloth, coats, and sweaters hanging. No, these were costumes. Costumes had hung here in the dark, hiding their colors, but allowing themselves to be felt by every cheek and small hand that passed through. Rubber padded palms and fingers swayed this way and that. Reflections on false eyes passed overhead. Charlie reached the end and turned to look back. She crouched down, looked up at the empty space. It didn't feel empty. She could still feel the costumes. They were hanging all around her. There was something else in the closet with her, kneeling down at her own height. It was her friend, the little boy. My little brother. They were both playing and hiding together, as they always did. This time was different. The little boy looked up toward the door, suddenly, as though they had been caught doing something they shouldn't have been doing. Charlie looked up as well. There was a figure in the door. It looked like one of the costumes was standing on its own, but it was motionless, so still that Charlie wasn't sure what she was seeing. It was a rabbit, the yellowish-brown rabbit they loved, but it did not dance or sing, just stood there and stared at them, unblinking. They began to squirm under its gaze, and the little boy screwed up his face to wail. Charlie pinched his arm, seized with an instinctual sense that they must not cry. The rabbit looked back and forth from one to the other with those all-too-human eyes, ponderous as though weighing and measuring them in some way that Charlie could not understand. Like it was making a momentous decision, Charlie could see its eyes, its human eyes, and she was cold with terror. She felt the fear in her brother as well, felt it echoing between them, reverberating and growing because it was shared. They could not move, they could not scream, and finally, the creature inside that patchwork, ragged, yellow rabbit suit reached forward for the boy. There was a moment, a single moment, when the children still clung together, grouping hands, but the rabbit snatched the boy to his breast, yanking them apart, and fled. From that moment, the entire memory shattered with piercing and unrelenting screams. Not her brother's, but her own. People rushed to help. Her father picked her up and held her, but nothing could console her. She screamed and screamed, louder and louder. Charlie snapped back from a dream the sound still high and painful in her ears. She was crouched down in silence. John stood at the door, not daring to interrupt. She did not remember much of what had happened next. Everything was dark. It was all a blur of images and facts she had pieced together later. Things she might remember and others she might have imagined. She was never in the restaurant again. She knew her parents shuttered the doors immediately. 
Then they moved to the new house, and Charlie's mother left a little while after that. Charlie did not remember her saying goodbye, although she knew her mother must have. Her mother would not have left without a goodbye, but it was just lost in the midst of time and grief, like so much else. She remembered the first time she stood in the doorway of her father's workshop. The first day they were alone in everything. It was the day he began to build her a mechanical toy, a little dog who tilted its head from side to side. She smiled when she saw it finished, and her father looked at her the same way he would look at her for the rest of his life, as though he loved her more than life itself, and as though his love made him unbearably sad. She knew, even then, that something vital inside him had broken, something that could never be repaired. Sometimes, he seemed to look right through her, as if he couldn't see her, even when she was standing right in front of him. Her father never again spoke her brother's name, and so Charlie learned not to speak it either, as though to speak it would send them back to that time and unravel them both. She woke in the mornings and looked for the little boy, having forgotten in her dreams that he was gone. When she turned to where he would be and saw only her stuffed toys, she would cry, but she would not say his name. She was afraid to even think it, and she trained her mind to shrink from it until she truly forgot, but deep inside she knew it. Sammy. A rumbling sound rose, loud and low, like a train passing, and Charlie startled. A train? She looked around her, eyes wide. She was disoriented, not sure if she was in the past or present. It's okay. I don't think it's anywhere near here. Might just be a big truck. John took Charlie's arm and pulled her to her feet. Do you remember something? He whispered. He was trying to catch her gaze, but she was focused elsewhere. A lot. Charlie put her hand to her mouth, still staring into the darkness as if she could see the scene. John's hand on her arm was an anchor, and she clung fast to it. This is real. This is now, she thought. And she turned to him, seized by a fierce gratitude that he was there with her. She buried her face in his chest, as if his body could shield her from what she had seen, and she let herself cry. John hugged her tight, one hand on her head, cautiously stroking her hair. They stayed that way for long moments, and at last she calmed her breathing deep, and even again, John loosened his grip on her, and as soon as he did, Charlie stepped back, suddenly aware of how close they had been. John's hands were still suspended in midair from where Charlie had been. After a moment of shock, he lowered one and used the other to scratch his head. So, he hoped for an answer to fill the silence. A rabbit, Charlie said calmly, looking toward the doorway. A yellow rabbit. Her voice became graver as the image was still fresh in her mind. The one I saw the night Michael disappeared. The bear. I'm pretty sure he was yellow too. I thought you said it was like the others, Charlie said. I thought it was. When everybody said Freddy was brown, that night we first met up. I just thought I was remembering it wrong. I mean, I really don't have a great memory for back then, you know? I didn't even remember what color my old house was. But then you said he was yellow too. Yeah, they were yellow, she nodded. It was the answer he was expecting. I think it's connected. The animals from here. And the one I saw at Freddy's. And the one that took my brother, Charlie thought. She took a final look around the place. Let's go back, she said. I want to get out of here. Okay, John said. As they headed to the door, a small object caught Charlie's eye, and she snatched it up. It was a twisted piece of metal, and as John watched close by, she stretched it out, then let it snap back together with a loud crack like a whip. John jumped. What is that? he said. 
composing himself. I'm not sure, she said, but she slipped it into her pocket. John was watching her, like there was something he wanted to say. Let's go, Charlie said. They began the trek back to the car. Sammy, then years later, Michael, and the other kids. Of course it's connected, Charlie thought. Lightning might strike twice, but not murder. Can you drive again? She asked, after a long period of silence. The only sound so far had been their shoes, crunching through the dry grass. Yeah, of course, he said. John managed to get the car turned around, and the constricted space, and Charlie settled against the window, her eyes half closed already. She watched the trees fly by outside her window, and felt herself beginning to doze. The metal object in her pocket was digging into her leg, keeping her awake, and she repositioned it, thinking dreamily of the first time she saw one of the things. She was sitting with Sammy in the restaurant before it opened for the day. They were under a window in a dusty beam of light, playing some invented game she could no longer remember, and their father came over, grinning. He had something to show them. He held up the piece of twisted metal and showed them how it opened, then let it snap back in his hand. They both cried out in surprise, then started giggling and clapping their hands. Their father did it again. I could snap off your nose, he said, and again they laughed, but quickly, his face turned serious. I mean it, he said. This is a spring lock, and I want you to know how it works, because it's very dangerous, and I don't ever want you touching these. This is why we never put our hands in the animal costumes. It's very easy to trigger these if you don't know what you're doing, and you could get hurt. It's like touching the stove. Do we ever touch the stove? They shook their heads with a solemnity beyond their years. Good, because I want you both to grow up with all your noses, he cried. And he swept them up, one in each arm, swinging them around as they laughed. Suddenly, there was a loud snap. Charlie jolted out of sleep. What was that? What was what? John said. The car was off. Charlie looked around. They were back at the motel. Charlie took a moment to reorient herself, then gave a reluctant smile. Thanks for driving. What were you dreaming about? John said. You looked happy. Charlie shook her head. I don't remember. And that is the end of chapter five. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Five Nights at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you did, please hit that like button. I really do appreciate it. And if you are new to this channel, subscribe for the next chapter of this novel. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to my second channel where I do reaction videos. The link will be in the description. Also, make sure you click that bell so you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video. And I'll be back next week with the next chapter. Alright, see ya.